name is Kathy Minden, and I'm a member of League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County. And it's a pleasure to be gathered together today to hear about health care, and especially health care changes in Oregon. And we have with us today Dr. Camilo Marquez. He's co-chair of Jobs with Justice Health Care Committee, also on Health Care for All Oregon Legislative Committee. And he's with the Portland Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. He has spoken and written extensively on health care reform. So we need every minute today, and we have questions for you at the conclusion of your comments. So we need to get started. Thank you. Actually, I think I will uh, begin with some questions because I think that if you keep some questions in your mind as I'm speaking, you'll be able to formulate, I guess, some uh, refinement of the own questions that you have and perhaps become a little bit more specific about what you want to learn. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify what I believe are the key issues in, in health care reform. These may not necessarily be the issues for you. So that's, that's one of the first questions you should think about. For you, as individuals, what are the key issues in health reform? And for you, as an organization of the League of Women Voters, what are the key issues that you should address as a volunteer citizen group? What sort of message might you want to carry to the people that you serve, uh, since you're, you're an organization that, that promotes the uh, elective process? The issues that we're going to be talking about are political and are eventually going to turn up on the ballot. And uh, I know that you don't take positions on those kinds of things, but you may want to promote a full open discussion about what these issues are. So the question first, what are the key questions in health care reform? What are the key health reform issues that you want to learn about and discuss? What role might the League of Women Voters play in these issues? What do you as individuals see for yourselves in the health reform movement and what direction would you like it to take? So I'm going to begin the sort of structured part of my talk by suggesting to you a way for you to think about health care reform, a way for you to conceptualize health care reform. And I've given you each a handout, and this handout essentially is a review of the history of health care reform over the past hundred years. There have been about six attempts to create health care reforms in the United States in the past hundred years. And what I've given you here documents it fairly closely. I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but I will highlight a few points that are relevant to events that are happening today. And in terms of, of, of looking at this history and the, the level of detail that it has for you. With regard to taking a conceptual approach, one of the things that you may want to keep in mind is how narrowly or how broadly do you want to look at the issues of health care reform. Now, if you really want to be a student of it, there's a lot of information available. There's a lot that you can learn. There's a lot of depth that you can get into. And it's, it's relatively easy to find this information. I have not been uh, involved in, in health care reform actively my whole career. It's only in the past couple of years since I retired and moved here that I've gotten involved. And I mean, I was aware of what was going on. I was even a member of Physicians for a National Health Plan for the past 20 years or so, but because I was working, I wasn't active. But now that I'm retired, I'm, I'm active. and. I wanted to educate myself, and I, I found just an incredible number of resources that you can get on the internet, 
a lot of books that are, that are uh, readily available. You go on Amazon and, and you just hook in the search and you can find a lot of information. So it's easy. On the back of this uh, handout that I've given you is a, um, a bibliography and that will help guide you to some of the sources of information. Now, returning to the conceptual approach, I see it consisting of, of three elements. First is historical, and here in the handout you have pretty detailed information of the timeline. The second is structural, and by structural I mean how does the health system break down organizationally? That is one of the key issues for you to keep in mind as you're being bombarded with information from different sides, different sides that have different stakes in different parts of this structure. And in order to know what's the meaning of the healthcare reform discussion that's going on now, you really should comprehend this, this structural idea. The third element is moral. It's a moral issue because essentially healthcare, the way it's treated today, is being treated like essentially any commodity that's bought and sold in the marketplace. And I think, you know, we have a, a, a really deep issue in terms of how the, the consequences of this notion of healthcare being a commodity plays out in people's lives. Uh, we know that if it's a commodity, it means it has a price. And if it has a price, it means some people can afford it and some people can't afford it. And, you know, maybe it's, it's reasonable to distribute most other things that we use as, as a commodity. That it's okay that, you know, how much stuff you have depends upon how much money you have. But is healthcare one of those things that should be distributed, allocated on the basis of how much money you have? Or is there another way to look at it? And I think that's the, the, the essential aspect of this moral approach. Um, the moral approach is difficult because, I mean, it, it really has some sort of deep philosophical and historical roots. I mean, I'm sure you all know about the Declaration of Independence. If we say we're all endowed with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are basic rights. Um, but how this is interpreted in terms of the delivery of health care um, really takes some thought. And, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but it's just something that you're aware of, that this, that this is an element of, of the argument. And I, and, I, and I mention it because I have a particular take on it myself. I'm a member of Healthcare for All Oregon, as was mentioned by Kathy. We have a slogan that is really at the top of our masthead, healthcare is a human right. There are people who believe ardently in that idea that we should have health, everyone deserves healthcare as a basic right. There are people who don't believe in that. And um, I'm not really prepared to, to argue this, this issue. What I can say is that the people who believe it have rallied around and have become a part of this organization. And this idea has really propelled the movement to where it is today. But we're going to be beginning a campaign that's going to try to reach out to people who may not see it that way. And I think that there are other approaches by which we can spread our message. So I'm not going to say anything more about the moral aspect or the idea of healthcare being a human right. I'm going to look at it today more from a, an economic perspective and from a spec perspective in terms of general social welfare in our community. So we started off uh, speaking about 
healthcare in our present system is essentially a commodity and that uh, it's something that, that's distributed on the basis of a price and it, it's, it's something that's exchanged in the marketplace. Um, one of the key issues in healthcare reform in history has been what the impact of rising healthcare costs has been on all of us as individuals, families, institutions, on labor and business, on government budgets. I think that if you were to take a, 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 a close examination of current controversies in, in public life, what's being discussed in the newspapers and in the legislative bodies, you'll find at the root of so many of these controversies is the rising cost of health care. People are concerned about school budgets, about teachers being laid off. People are concerned about rising tuition in higher education and the tremendous debt that student graduates have to bear because these costs are rising. At every level, you know, from the city to the county to the state to the federal government, the, the arguments about deficits and austerity and looking at entitlements and, you know, we face this issue over the, the fiscal cliff and what we're going to do about the, the deficit. Much of this has to do with the cost of health care. Um, now, if, if you review, review the history, you see that this issue of health care costs really didn't come into play until the 1970s. And bef before I, I leave the history altogether, I want to uh, just reference a few issues in the history which I want you to keep in mind as we're discussing health care reform and, and the the system that we're trying to reform. And, and the reason that's important is, is that all the discussions about what kind, what kind of reforms are we going to make to deal with the rising cost of health care, to deal with the issues of access to health care, to deal with the issues of, of um, people who are covered and uncovered and, and, and those people whose coverage is inadequate because they have such high deductibles and co-pays that the health care really is not saving them from getting into financial trouble when they do get sick. The present system that we have is really the result of several accidents. Um, I think that the first question you might want to ask about the way healthcare is organized is why should healthcare be related, healthcare coverage be related to your employment? Most people get their coverage through their, uh, their jobs, their employers. What is, what is, what is the reason for that? Is, is that true in, in other places, other countries? Is, is there a, a good reason why that should be? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that there's any obvious, apparent, logical reason that, that our health coverage should be provided through our employers. But there is a historical explanation for it, and that is that uh, during World War II, there were price controls. That means salaries couldn't go up, prices couldn't go up. But what companies did in order to attract the labor, and, and you know, because men were off fighting the war, they needed employees in the in the factories to to make all the things that we needed for the war effort and plus at home. Companies were able to bargain by offering health care benefits. So health care benefits was a part of your salary. Now you don't think about health care benefits being a part of your salary now, but if you look at what's happening today in, in labor negotiations, workers are giving up salary in order to keep their health care benefits. Does that make any sense? I don't know. So the reason 
that we have our health care through our employees is because of this accidental situation. The next issue that uh, is a historical accident, you know we have had some health reforms along the way and, and uh, the first of these was uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid is for the poor, Medicare is for the elderly. How is it that we have a, a, a system of health care that covers segments of the population like this? Does that make any sense? The poor should get coverage, the elderly should get coverage. Not only that, under Medicare, if you have certain kinds of diseases, you can get coverage. If you have end-stage renal disease, you can get covered. Why should some diagnosis be covered and not another? Does that make any sense? No. The system we have is a fragmented patchwork, a crazy quilt that has no logical coherence. And this is, again, an accident of history. I'll be a little bit more specific about the, the way Medicare and, and Medicaid came about. We have a program for the poor under Medicaid because it so happened that when health care reform was being considered in the 50s and 60s, the way Congress was organized, the Democratic Party was in control and the people who were in control of the, the committees that handled these issues happened to be from the South because they were elected over and over again. They had tenure. They got rewarded with seniority and the chairmanship of these com committees. They controlled how the legislation came out. And Wilbur Mills of Arkansas was the chairman of the House Finance Committee or Ways and Means Committee. And as you know, during the 50s and 60s, there was segregation. They did not want any bills passed with, with a sort of federal authority that would result in the integration of the hospitals. So Medicaid was established to allow the states to control the administration of the program and they could essentially segregate the way the system was operated. That's the reason that we have uh, two different systems, Medicare being essentially a federal system, Medicaid being a system that's operated by the states where they had essentially authority to uh, distribute the money from Medicaid according to, to uh, local uh, preferences. And that meant that it was possible for them to discriminate. So, I mean, that's essential part of the history of the way our system was developed. And I think it's, it's very unfortunate. I don't think that uh, we should have a system where we consider some people to be deserving of health care, some people to consider to have earned it. And that's the way Medicaid and Medicare breaks down. People on Medicaid are considered to be less deserving than those on Medicare who have paid into the system and, you know, basically getting what they pay for. So these are just some of the, the structural issues and historical issues that confront us today in the way healthcare is organized. So now returning to, to what I began with, what, what are the key issues? Um, and the conceptual approach, let me come back to, you know, identify what, what these issues are. As I mentioned before, costs and after costs are issues of quality and standards. After that are issues of access to health care, who is able to get into the system, who can afford it, who has coverage, who doesn't. 
what kind of disparities in the quality of care, the standards of care, does, does this result in different demographic and regional groups? And how is the system organized as, as I've been referencing? So let's, let's first look at the, the issue of cost then. The issue of cost, I think, has, has been driving um, the health care reform arguments since the 70s, as I mentioned. Presently, I think with, with uh, the, the effort to achieve some greater access, we've had the, the uh, effort that resulted in Obamacare that's going to increase the number of people who are covered. So. What you see, what you see with, with the, the effort to, to accomplish health reform through Obamacare was really a focus on access. They're trying to expand the availability of coverage. And it does not really deal directly, specifically with the issue of costs. But it's always in the background because the health care system is a very costly, very lucrative, one in which there are stakeholders who have a piece of the pie that they're looking to enlarge or preserve. And, you know, reform efforts may result in some sort of redistribution of, of this, this pie. So the people who, who uh, are stakeholders, in other words, who have uh, have an iron in this fire who's, who, who may end up losing money, losing, a, losing power in the market, are going to be very active players if we see health care is going to re, make, result in any kind of reforms. Some of you, I'm sure, remember the uh, effort during the Clinton years to uh, accomplish a bill, and, and the, the health insurance industry came out with a very effective campaign, Harry and Louise, where they, you know, were complaining with, with each other about this new program and talking over the dinner table and say, well, you know, do we want this? What's this going to result in? And, and of course, that uh, effort didn't go anywhere. But let me just, let me just identify what, what some of these numbers are, just so you have an idea. Healthcare represents one sixth of the economy. There's total healthcare expenditures of, of about two and a half trillion dollars. That's 17% of the gross national product. That is more than the gross national product of Germany. Germany is the third largest economy in the world. So let me break down this figure of two and a half trillion dollars of health care expenditures. Where does it go? Who's, who's, who, who is represented in this figure? So we're talking about in 2009 a total of 2.5 five billion dollars. Of this total, health insurance represented 1.7, hospitals 0.7, physicians 0.5, out-of-pockets 0.3. So let me change that from a decimal into actual numbers. Total health care was Two trillion four hundred eighty-six billion. Health insurance was one trillion seven hundred sixty-seven million. Hospitals seven hundred sixty-nine billion. Physicians had five hundred and six billion. Out-of-pocket expenses were three hundred billion. So that's the stake. A big stake that people are not going to give up. And that's why those companies have the resources. They're going to mount a uh, 
fierce campaign against any kind of reform. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the industry in the medical sector, in billions, the entire healthcare industry capitalization is 71,000 billions plus. Drug manufacturing represents 56,000 billions. Health insurance, 534. Health plans, uh, or rather hospitals, 698. To give you some idea of, of what all this money results in for the, the people who are the captains of these industries. I looked up on the internet what the salaries of CEOs in the health industry are. They're all over $20 million. $20 million compensation. The average worker makes about $34,000 a year. So in terms of what this represents on a, on a more personal basis, if you look at uh, this total health care expenditure of $2.5 trillion, that means for every man, woman, and child in the United States, we spend about $8,000. So that, that's the key cost. Eight, about $8,000 a year is, is spent on per capita. Now, if you look at other countries and the, the ones who are interested in the ones that we can compare to the United States, the other industrialized countries, the average is half, under $4,000. So we're spending twice as much money on healthcare per person than all the other industrialized countries. So, you know, you may want to ask the question, does that mean that we're getting... Uh, a better product? Is, is health care better, in the, twice as good in the United States as it is in the rest of the world? Sadly you say it's not. I mean one measure by the World Health Organization of the quality and standard of care places the United States 37th in the world. So this is dramatic I think. We're paying twice as much and we're getting not as good care. Now the thing that characterizes the difference between the United States and all these other countries, as I described to you in the beginning, our system is fragmented, our system is based on a market principle, profit, for-profit principle. All these other countries have universal health care. Everyone is covered. They don't have the problem of people worrying about whether they're going to be taken care of if they get sick or have an accident. They don't have the problem of worrying about how they're going to pay for it. They don't have the problem of worrying if they get sick and they have medical bills, are they going to lose all their savings, go into bankruptcy, have to mortgage their house, have to take away their children's in inheritance? That just doesn't happen. Do they have the problems with um, budgets over there? Of course. But they don't have the, the problem where we're all sort of fighting one another over this small dwindling pie because of the way we allocate health care resources through the marketplace. People know what they're entitled to. They know what they're going to get. They know what they pay for. Just in the paper recently, there were articles about hospital costs. It's just, just impossible to know what anything costs when you go to the hospital when, to get treatment. Uh, this is all proprietary information. It depends upon what kind of coverage you have. Um, in these countries, you know, there's a list on the wall of what everything is. But it really doesn't matter because it's all going to be covered. So, you know, these 
dramatic numbers and dramatic differences between us and the rest of the world and how it filters down to impact you as a consumer of healthcare is dramatic enough on a personal level, but you know, as I've mentioned, it's just causing our system to fall under increasingly difficult strains as we find our budgets being reduced and we're not able to afford the essential services that we need. So uh, that's the kind of issue that's, that's driving the arguments today about, about health care. So what, what, are we, what are we trying to do about this? You hear arguments about the entitlements. We, you know, we have to make cuts here and there. We hear arguments about how we're going to control or discussions about how we're going to control costs. How, we're, how are we going to get this system under control? So as you know, in Oregon, we have the healthcare transformation. Governor Kitzhaber has been working on trying to improve the way services are delivered. And this brings me back to, to something that, that I really didn't uh, describe fully enough when I was talking about the structure of how the system is organized. And the key elements that I want you to, to, to keep in mind about the structural concept is that on the one hand you have service providers, doctors, hospitals, clinics. On the other hand you have the finance system. These people who provide the services are paid for the most part out of private insurance. So reforms can take place on either side of this in terms of how healthcare is delivered, in terms of how healthcare is financed. When I mentioned Governor Kitzhaber's plan to transform the Oregon Health Plan, which as you I'm sure know is Medicaid in, in Oregon, he proposes to have a better system the, the way healthcare is delivered so that we don't have fee for service, each doctor getting paid a fee for each procedure that they do, which provides an incentive for doctors to do more procedures, more expensive procedures. But let's have a global budget for the Oregon Health Plan and let's get people into what they're calling medical homes which is a basically a way of saying that this is a group of people that we can follow more closely and let's have their services provided by a coordinated care organization where their their well-being can be tracked so people are, are uh, not following up on taking their medication they can send out a worker to check on that and prevent readmissions to hospitals prevent diseases from becoming worse Oregon has $1.9 billion from the federal government and the deal that the governor made was if you can reduce Medicare, Medicaid expenses by 2%, I believe, you get to keep the money. So that's the challenge and this is what the governor is focused on. This is only for people who are in the uh, Oregon Health Plan or Medicaid. This doesn't apply to the rest of the people who are on private insurance. So much of the, much of the discussion about health care costs has to do with the way health care is delivered, but the people that, that I am involved with in Health Care for All Oregon approach this issue from a, a different way. It's not that we're not aware of uh, the importance of how healthcare delivery is organized, but we see that the financing system, the system of private insurance, is really the chief factor in the high cost of care. The main reason for that is because of what is called administrative cost. There's something, there's a term you may have heard of called medical loss ratio, and this is one of the things that Obamacare addressed. They said 
the medical loss ratio can be no more than 80-20. And that means that 80% of what you pay in your premium has to go to pay for your care. Only 20% can be taken off for administration. And administration means claims adjusting, um, whatever kinds of paperwork that the insurance company has to do to run their system, plus profit. So profit is a very significant part of this so-called medical loss ratio. And what we know is that systems like Medicare, the administration costs are much less, only 3% compared to insurance companies, private insurance companies, which is 20, 25%. Now, because of the way insurance company earns its money, uh, two key ways. One is by having a population in their pool that they insure that's not very sick, so they don't have to pay very many claims. That's called cherry picking. Two is to deny claims when they can, and three is to not reimburse the doctors because of some administrative reason. So when you go to your doctor's office, you see that there's these racks of, of files, and there are two or three, usually women, who are doing what they call uh, claims evaluations and, or um, um, that's not the right word. But what they're, what they're doing is they're, they're going over the paperwork in order to make sure that the claims get paid. This cost to, to your doctor, who has to hire these people to, to do this, is about 10%. So the administrative costs of our system are upwards of 20, 30, 40%. This would be completely eliminated under what we call a single-payer system, which is essentially what Medicare is. Medicare is supported by payroll taxes, and your doctors, service providers are reimbursed, and the cost to do that to the Medicare administration is only 3%. So if you, if you take a look at the difference between what a single payer system compared to a private healthcare system would, would be in terms of just these administrative costs alone, it, it comes up to about $400 billion. And that would be enough to cover all of the people who do not have health coverage today. So that really is the, the key incentive. We can have a system where everyone is covered we wouldn't have to pay any more for it. It could be paid for out of what is presently being wasted in the private health insurance market as profit and administration. As I mentioned before, healthcare insurance CEOs, hospital administrators, they make salaries of $20 million a year. That's where these profits are going. So just to uh, sort of reinforce this concept of, of single payer and make sure that you understand that, what we're talking about is instead of having all these different entities that pay your providers, either private insurance or different forms of, of reimbursement from Medicare, Medicaid, uh, workers' compensation, um, VA, Indian Health Services, county medical services, municipal services. There would be one payer, there'd be one system, and your treatment would be paid for out of money that is collected. There's a bill now in, in uh, the House of Representatives, rather the, the Oregon legislature, to establish this kind of a system here in Oregon. 
It's been done in Vermont. There are 25 other states that are trying to accomplish this. And, and the reason for this is, I mean, of course it should be a national program, but that's just not going to go anywhere politically. But we think that we can do it here in Oregon. And the campaign that I'm a part of has been rolling and we're gaining strength. We're, we're reaching out to people. The reason that I'm here, I'm going to speak to you about health care reform generally, but to represent this idea that we can have affordable health care for all Oregon. There's another bill in the legislature which is being considered that will study how the best way to, to finance the system. You know, would it be income taxes, uh, what other, uh, other kinds of, of uh, ways of gathering these resources to the public treasury that would be dedicated to paying for your health care. And we'll have a lot of answers to questions that you may have on how is this going to affect me personally. One of my colleagues says, you know, there may be some of you whose taxes will go up under this system. But remember, you won't have any more premiums, you won't have any more co-pays, no deductibles. You go into the doctor and it's covered. You don't have to worry about how you finance health care, how you pay your premiums. You don't have to worry about keeping your job because if you move to another job, you're going to lose your coverage. You don't have to worry about having your health care taken care of if, if you lose your job and you can't get any coverage. I mean, that's just something that just all goes away. And a few other of the key issues in health care, I think that that this kind of a system will uh, improve or resolve have to do with you know, things that I mentioned that are key, quality, standards, access, fairness, disparities, and organization. Um, this is a system which will be open, transparent. It will have standards that apply to everyone there's not going to be any Cadillac plan or gold plan and bronze plan. There's going to be one plan that covers all the basic services. It's going to be transparent. We're going to know how it operates. They're going to be, uh, under the legislation that I referred to, there would be five district-wide community boards that would be available for people to address their concerns, to uh, identify what they think is important about how this program should be operated. Um, in terms of, of the organization of care, you know, you would have um, one system that is doing the budgeting rather than, uh, you know, so many different entities. And, and what we see now, because Healthcare care is, is driven by the market. You see companies that offer health care services, companies that other, offer health care finances, consolidating their control over the market. So that means there's less providers available, less insurance companies. They're trying to gain market power in order to determine how much reimbursement they have to pay or how much they can charge for services. And the result of this means that you know the consumer, the patient, families, they're at the short end of the stick because they don't have any control over what goes on in the marketplace. So I think that uh, sort of to summarize, um, you know, I've tried to give you some ideas about what the key issues are, what some of the background and historical issues are what some of the, what I refer to as the structural issues are, namely the difference between providing services and paying for services, and how we at Healthcare for All Oregon are planning to do something about this and, and how the new system would work. It's going to be a real challenge, as I mentioned, because the stakeholders are going to 
try to uh, prevent this from happening, but we have a movement going, and, and the hope is that in the next two or three years, we're going to gather enough momentum, we're going to gather enough signatures on petitions, we're going to convince a million people to vote for this so that everybody will have their due in terms of, of health care, a system that's, that has high standards, that's easy to access, where no one is left out, everybody is in, and you know, we won't have to have the, the kinds of anxiety and uh, political struggles that we have now over budgets and, and other issues in, in, our, uh, in our public welfare. So that's, that's it. I'll take any questions. How would that affect somebody on Medicare? So that's a good point because Medicare is a federal program. You essentially are already in a single payer program. In the state, what we would hope to do is to incorporate that into the state's program so that whatever we're receiving now as Medicare payments, we would require waivers from the federal government to allow that to become part of our program. And Obamacare has a provision that by 2017, a state can develop a program that, that fulfills the objective of the Obamacare. And once we have those waivers, we would collect all the money that goes presently to Medicaid and Medicare and um, I guess uh, other kinds of, of government programs. And that can be utilized for anybody who seeks care through the Oregon Health um, System. I think about health care in a holistic manner. And when you go to the grocery store, it's difficult to buy bread, it's difficult to buy a lot of grocery items that does not have high fructose corn syrup in it. So, th so there's a contradictory system set up where you know, on one hand the government subsidizes food products which contributes to obesity and, and obesity relates to di pre-diabetes, diabetes, kidney failure, all these health systems within the body and yet they, the government still couldn't uh, deal with the food manufacturers about adding additional sugar and salt to our foods. How, how can having a single-payer system or, a, or an integrated health care system deal with some of these issues so I don't have to feel so guilty <laughs> when I eat some of the food products because of time and the convenience of being able not to do everything by scratch, which is probably the healthiest. How can we address some of these bigger issues within this health care Refor well, reformation. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that's an important point, and, and I think that's one of the things that the, the Oregon Health Transformation is trying to do. They're trying to conceptualize health very broadly, and they give the example of a woman who had repeated hospitalizations. She was overweight, she lived in a hot, stuffy apartment, and they found that if they had just figured out some way to get her an air conditioner that you know, she would be relieved of the congestion and she would have fewer hospital admissions. So the idea is to think about things more broadly. I don't think that uh, a system where we include these kinds of broad perspectives that would include education, prevention, nutrition, you know, hopefully in, in, the, in the system that, that we finally accomplish, we'll be able to have more access to knowledge about this, but whether or not that's going to do anything to change what's available in your supermarket, I don't know. But it occurs to me that if, if we're able 
to be smart enough, sophisticated enough to, to transform the healthcare system, we could transform the system that, that subsidizes all of these things that are bad for you. I mean, I think that's going to be a political question because you're talking about agriculture, another wealthy corporate entity that, that has a big stake in all these things. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to have people organize and just stand up to it and say, you know, you know, we want decent quality food available to us. Yes. Excuse me. Which foreign countries have the most efficient health care systems? Well, our neighbor to the north, Canada, has one. Um, I think all or most of the countries in Europe have national health. Certainly, uh, England, you know, has an, uh, the national health uh, system. Uh, if you watch the Olympics, you, you saw that they, they uh, had in the, in the um, opening ceremony, they had a, a portrayal of how that system operates. Certainly France, Germany. And one, one of the things you'll see in, in the history is that this whole idea of national health began in Germany. Um, it's also spread to the Far East. Taiwan has a good system. Um, I mean, all of the industrialized countries in the world have national health systems. Some of them do have private insurance, but they're highly regulated. So that, in a sense, they're, they're not really for-profit uh, organizations. Yes, Kathy. I'd just like to comment on your credentials as um, you have residency in psychiatry and fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry. And, and um, there are elements to healthcare, again, I'm thinking holistically, that involve mental health. How will mental health be addressed? Because I think right now people are barely aware of some of the costs associated uh, with mental health and we have um, the need to address mental health in our society. Some of the violence that we're seeing is resulting from underlying mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues underlying those. So where, where does that come into a healthcare system? So to put your question in the perspective that, that I tried to outline in terms of the structural organization of healthcare, you're talking about healthcare services, the delivery of services. So that's the side of this piece that we're looking at. Um, the legislation that, that you know, we are talking about really is focused on the finance. So um, how this issue would play out of how we have um, services organized, you know, I think that uh, if we begin to reduce the incentive for specialization, specialization where high incomes are made by doing these procedures. Um, the focus becomes more on primary care. I think that's probably where we're going to have to begin to begin to answer that question. You know, I think your previous question also in terms of looking at health broadly and looking at preventative issues, you know, what are we going to do in order to improve our knowledge base of how to live a healthy life and that's going to include understanding about you know part that violence plays in our lives and it's going to mean you know what kind of um, systems do we want to have that offer protection and, and offer us a way of avoiding those kinds of situations where people get into trouble domestic violence um, opportunities for children to develop, opportunities for recreation, uh, 
opportunities for, for fitness, you know, how are we going to provide all of the basic services to give people um, you know, a, a sense of balance in their lives. That's not going to do anything for the people who do develop serious mental illnesses. You know, we need to figure out how to make these services more available. And I know that they're, you know, concentrated in urban areas, rural areas. Some places don't even have hospitals, no less any kind of um, professional mental health services. So I think um, as our healthcare budgets become more rationalized, and it's not just based on a, on a profit motivation, I think that we'll be able to to make better plans. I and mean, I think that's one of the things that will happen with the organization of healthcare is that we'll be able to review how healthcare resources are, are allocated. Is it going to be allocated just on the basis of what services make the most profit or where there is a need? Um, this is probably something that should be looked at on a national level and, and there probably should be programs just as we have in education where we know that um, you know people who deserve special programs can be supported by programs that are developed on the federal and state levels and, and uh, served and operationalized in the, on the community. Um, And this, this is, this uh, I think, is the right approach to to, to look at healthcare in, in this sort of broad uh, perspective, and to think about the kinds of changes that we need to this to the overall system. But we're gonna we're gonna have to start with, you know, the basic issues of of access and finance, and take it from there. Yes. You mentioned a couple, maybe just one bill in the current Oregon legislature. Do you have a number on that? The uh, Act for Affordable Health Care for All Oregon is HB 2922, sponsored by uh, Representative Michael Denbro and about 22 or 23 other representatives. The other bill is HB 3260. This bill is the one that will charge the Oregon Health Authority with determining what's the best system of finance. And that is a bill which is going to be um, financed through uh, private subscriptions. There's no public money going into that. But the purpose of that is to do research and analysis and come up with an evaluation of different systems to see which would be the best to, to uh, support health care for all Oregon. Are there any other questions? Um, this might be a two-part question, one for the Obama health care and one for the Oregon health transference. Um, how would the health care plans be prepared to deal with uh, non-American citizens either working on visa or a student visa? The uh, act that's presently in the legislature would cover everyone and there are no qualifications whatsoever. So anybody who lives, works in Oregon would be covered. Um, if you live in Washington and work in, in Oregon, you'd be covered. If you're driving in or, uh, Washington and you're from Oregon and you have an accent, you'd be covered there. So it is truly universal. And that is uh, a bedrock aspect of our, our principle, that it's truly universal. If you travel in Europe and you break your arm, you're going to be taken care of. You're not going to have to worry about it because that's, that's how universal health care is done across the world. Well, thank you very much. 
Uh, I also just wanted to mention that I'm filling in for Sam Nets, and I am uh, honored to be his replacement and to come and talk before you today. Thank you. And Peter, while we're still on camera, I just would like to thank Dr. Marquez. This is a very complex issue. Um, it's so important because we know with the aging baby boomer population that health care has to be reprioritized. It, it can't work unless we do. So I, I just wanted to let people know that this will be rebroadcast a few times uh, because I think it's something we may want to listen to more than once because it's of its complexity. So there will be a schedule that Metro East Community Media will display. But just to mention on Monday, May 20th at 6 p.m. and also on Tuesday, May 21st at 6 p.m. And then there they usually try to schedule in a few times as well. It's a very, very important issue, critical issue of our times. I know that uh, health care and taking care of ourselves and being as holistic as we can be in that approach is probably one of the most significant issues of our time. So thank you for taking your time today to come and present this to us. It's been my pleasure. So crucial. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.